Well, welcome everybody. Welcome to Conscious Cafe, Conscious Cafe Global. And uh, we are uh, global as of uh, these times where um, Conscious Cafe has been meeting. Um, Judy Piatkas started nine years ago uh, with a Conscious Cafe group in London. And the idea was to play, uh, create a, a place, a community of conversation where we could come together in community and talk about things that matter and raise consciousness our own and make a contribution to uplift in the world. Um, so many of us enjoyed that. We've started our own groups. I have a group in Skipton and Yorkshire. We have groups in uh, Canterbury, New Forest, Newbury, uh, Oundle, St. Albans in the UK. I uh, hope I've got them all there. And now we have, uh, or for some time actually, we have a group in Geneva. We have uh, Hannah with a group in Singapore. And recently we've just been talking about our colleague in Rome, Nadia in Rome. Um, we have uh, Rome and also Vancouver. I'm not sure anybody is going to be up with us from Vancouver today since that's an eight hour time difference. But um, so that's how you you know a lot of you have come here and uh welcome richard barrett thank you for joining us uh richard's our guest today and if i just explain how we're going to work it richard's um when i hand over to richard richard's going to uh you're going to take control of the screen richard uh, give us a presentation and a sharing and then uh, you can keep your comments and questions going and then whenever richard chooses to pause we can ask Richard questions and we have a maximum time of 90 minutes until 12.30. That's when we're scheduled to finish. The subject today is the seven stages of your soul's journey. And he's, what Rich is going to do is draw on his book, A New Psychology of Human Wellbeing. It is so apt for these times. It's such a perfect conversation for us. Um, I'm going to introduce Richard now. And um, I keep looking at the screen because I'm admitting people. Um, Richard is one of the most profound and evolutionary thinkers on all aspects of consciousness and values in the world today. And just to give you some background on Richard, uh, way back in 1996, he developed something called, it's called the Barrett Model, the seven levels of consciousness as a tool for mapping the consciousness of individuals and human group structures like teams, organizations, communities, and nations. And he realized that specific values could be associated with each of those levels of consciousness, both in individuals and in organizations. And, and Richard, I do need to acknowledge you for the tremendous work that you've done, you know, in creating the Barrett Value Center in finding ways of bringing these new consciousness conversations into organizations and corporate arenas it's, it's amazing what you've done i think we first connected uh, around the time of we presenting at be the change and i saw that values presentation totally inspired by it have been since and um, what i understand is that you now have about eight thousand consultants and uh, coaches around the world who trained in this in this model uh, in a hundred countries um, 2018 founded the Barrett Academy for the advancement of human values to focus on deep personal transformation and societal transformation and developed a way of measuring the consciousness of nations and I think that's there in your latest book and this is just such uh, a resonant topic for right now and I just want to say in your book uh, we're drawing the new psychology of human well-being I was so I was really inspired by what somebody wrote about the book which was a hundred years from now, this will be the book that people cite as a major force in catalyzing the transformation of human consciousness. So if that's not all wonderful and timely, I don't know what it is. So we can wave our hands, we can clap, and we can welcome you. And Richard, I'd love to hand over to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> well, hello, everybody. Um, I, uh, I do... Uh, I think a visual presentation is sometimes good, but we're not going to spend a lot of time on visual presentation. Um, and uh, I have a tremendous amount of material. So I'm right at the beginning, I'm going to give you a website address where you can follow up and do all sorts of things. And I'm, first of all, I'm going to announce uh, my um, latest venture. So, uh, and then we'll get into the topic of the seven stages of soul journey or seven stages of psychological development, seven stages of personal uh, evolution, whatever, there, it goes by different names. So I'm going to um, put my screen up now 
Uh, you have to enable me to do that, Gina. Okay. Share, how do I do that? Share screen. Multiple participants can share simultaneously. Can you do that now? Um, Sorry, I didn't check that before. I didn't realize I had to do that. Okay, there we go. I will start by probably looking at ourselves and then we'll go to, uh, I got this already. And, uh, so as I promised, um, everybody sees screen with blue and pictures and things, yep. good. Yes, I'm the one okay, so yep. I give you this at the front because, you know, we're gonna cover a lot of topic topics. And so this is the place where you can go to get a lot more information. Um, and before getting underway with the seven stages, I want to, um, this is my latest venture. Uh, every year I've been writing a book for the last nine years, but this year, the first six months, I devoted to um, uh, building an e-learning platform. And uh, there are 18 courses. Uh, the thing we're gonna talk about today is this course here, seven stages of personal development. And the, these e-learning courses are, there are five groups, foundational courses, personal evolution, societal evolution, organizational evolution, leadership development. All these courses are up online except for the last four in the leadership. I'm working on those right now and they should be done by the end of June. Um, why is it not changing? One second. Ah, here we go. Well, okay, so that's what we're gonna talk about, the seven stages. Uh, when you, right now, as of four days ago, you can get three free courses if you sign up for the uh, e-learning academy. And uh, the free courses are Living a Values Driven Life at Home, at Work and in Society, The Wellbeing of Nations, which is a, what I call an info, an information course, and the Humanity Awareness Initiative, again, another information course. I'll mention that a little bit later. So these are the three free courses. All you have to do is sign up, and then in the top right-hand corner of your screen, there's a little dashboard, my dashboard, and there, you click on that and then you'll be able to see the courses and do the courses. So, so today I'm going to talk about seven stages of soul journey, seven stages of development. And I need to say this before we start, you know, we grow in stages of development. Every human being grows in stages of development. We operate from levels of consciousness. So, for example, the fourth stage of development, I call it individuation, is roughly from around 23, 24 to the uh, late 30s. That is, if you ever get through the individuation stage, that's when it usually occurs. And you can be operating, you can be at that stage of development and you can lose all your money and you can drop down to the first level of consciousness. So we grow in stages and we operate at levels. Usually the level of consciousness you're operating from will be the same as the stage of development you're at. But depending on what's going on, as I said, you can drop down to the survival level or you can have a mystical experience even at the individuating stage and experience level seven consciousness. So uh, we operate at levels of consciousness and we live inside worldviews. Now, over the past 200,000 years, um, Homo sapiens has actually evolved uh, six worldviews, and we're now moving into our seventh worldview, which I'm ca calling humanity awareness. And I've, I've done a whole e-learning course on what humanity awareness is going to look like. Um, and uh, that's like what I would call the post-COVID worldview. Um, so we live inside worldviews, and actually we have a worldview. So if you're in a particular country, then you find a particular worldview dominant in that country. You may be at a higher order worldview or a lower order worldview, which, which will say, well, you know, I am not happy in my country and therefore uh, I'm operating a different worldview from the worldview of my country. Now the worldview in a democratic regime, that worldview will represent the average stage of, and level of consciousness of the people. So what's interesting is that the worldview in the USA 
uh, has been going down. And the same in the UK, it's been going down. I've measured it 2014, 16, 18, and 19. Again, I'm not going to have a chance to go into all of that today, but the website I get, address I gave you earlier, um, which is barrettacademy.com, you can find all this information. So let's get into the meat and potatoes, as we say in Yorkshire. And uh, you know what that is, Gina, because you live in Yorkshire. So here we go. It's a personal journey. Now, everybody starts the journey um, at the surviving stage. Basically, this journey begins um, in the womb and uh, uh, the uh, reptilian mind brain begins to form during the first three months and it becomes operational at, at about three months of gestation and the embryo becomes a fetus. And at that moment, you know, the, the fetus is, is absolutely conscious um, and its uh, dominant mind brain is the reptilian mind brain, which I call the body mind. Um, then comes... Um, and, and the body mind stays dominant until about 18 months or two years, and we're moving to the conforming stage. Now, the limbic mind brain or the emotional mind, which has been developing in the background, becomes dominant and stays dominant until about the age of seven or eight, when the neocortex, which has been developing in the background, the rational mind, becomes dominant. We move into the differentiating stage. And that comes to an end roughly in the uh, early 20s, 21, 22, 23, which basically means that teenagers or anybody below the age of 20 doesn't have a fully functioning brain. And that is why teenagers do really stupid things because they don't have a fully developed rational mind. I've been there and I've done that. I can, you know, it's... Anyhow, most people on the planet never get past this stage. They never get to the individuating stage, which occurs roughly uh, around uh, early 20s through to late 30s. And at this stage, we're looking for freedom and autonomy to become who we are, to let go of our parental and cultural conditioning. Now, if you live in an authoritarian regime, that's very difficult. If you live in parents who've never, uh, who never self-actualized, that will be difficult. If you lived in the same place all your life, that will be difficult. So, Traveling and getting a higher education help with the individuating process. So um, the, the biggest issue on the planet right now is to increase the number of people individuating so that we can become a more conscious world. I'll talk about what conscious means in a moment. Once we get through this stage, we get to the self-actualizing stage, which uh, is, begins in the late 30s and 40s. And this is when you begin to, this is what I call really the first stage of soul activation. I'll come back to talk about the journey of the soul in a moment. So this is when you, having found freedom and autonomy in the individuating stage, in the self-actualizing stage, now you begin to align yourself with your deepest motivations, the, the, the gifts that you have at the soul level. And uh, you move then into the integrating stage in the 50s, which is uh, you've discovered what it is that is so important to you and that your gifts and talents, and now you want to make a difference in the world. But to do that, you need to integrate uh, and you need to connect with other people. You can't make a difference if you can't connect. And so connecting is very important in the 50s. And then in the 60s, we get to the serving stage where it's all about contribution. But there you have that, that the seven stages. The soul is present at the moment you are conceived and the soul mind is dominant for the first three months until the reptilian mind brain and the body mind takes over and the soul mind becomes the subconscious of the, of the body mind. And then when the emotional mind takes over um, around the age of two, the subconscious becomes the body mind and the soul mind becomes the unconscious. When the rational mind becomes dominant uh, from about eight and then onwards in our teenage years, the emotional mind becomes the subconscious, the body mind becomes the unconscious, and the soul mind becomes the super unconscious. So when we're very young, the soul mind is quite near the surface. Now, so once we get to the individuating stage, this is the stage where we, we've finished our ego development, and now we either stay there or we begin to recover the soul. And there are three stages of recovering the soul, the 
self-actualization level where we where we find uh, uh, our self-expression the integrating where we find our connection and the serving stage where we find our contribution so as our, our needs at each stage our needs change and because our whatever we need is what we value our values change now there are some values that you will always be there but basically as we move through these stages our needs and our values change so let's go back to the beginning um not motivation at this stage is staying alive though the body mind the reptilian mind brain is very active keeps the body in a state of homeostasis and what that little baby wants more than anything is to get its physical physiological needs met it needs a dry bottom it needs food it needs liquids and it needs to be cared for now at this stage it's um, fascinating because if the baby is cared for the baby learns that by crying out or making gesticulations, it gets its needs met. Now, if it doesn't get its needs met, if it's abandoned or the parents don't care, the baby learns that it is difficult to get its needs met and cannot trust the environment in which it lives. And so these people grow up to be micromanagers later on because they, they, they never got that response to their needs at this stage of development. Now, at a conforming stage, which is at two to uh, three to seven years of age, uh, the motivation is keeping safe. Now, you begin to see this links through to Maslow's survival, um, belonging. Keeping safe is all about belonging. And so, and it's also when the emotional mind is dominant. So, in order to keep safe, we need to be loved and we need to feel that we are loved. Um, and we need to feel this acceptance and this belonging. So these are the needs at this stage of development. Now, if you don't get the needs met here, you could grow up believing that you're not loved enough. Now, a lot of people grow up with not feeling loved enough. Uh, uh, it's amazing how many people, you know, you know grow up with and, and become adults and have this value wanting to be liked because they never really got all the love they needed at this stage of development. Now, that can be, later as an adult, that can work against you because, you know, you may not be able to speak the, your truth to somebody who you need love from, because if you tell them the truth, they may not love you anymore. So, you know, it, be, it becomes a, an issue uh, in our lives. Then we get to the differentiating stage, from roughly from 8 to 24. And our motivation here is feeling emotionally secure. And so we were in our parental house situation in the previous stage, and now we're out in the world at school and we want to feel secure in this outer world. And in order to feel secure, we need to feel recognized by our peers. We need to be part of a group. And so being part of a group is very important for teenagers. Now, if you are, don't feel recognized and you don't feel part of a group, uh, you will lose self-worth and self-esteem. And it's interesting that, you know, many of these school uh, shooters in America and elsewhere are, you know, teenagers who are, who didn't really get recognized by their parents, who are not part of an in-group at school and need to be recognized. Another interesting thing about this stage is this is when suicide becomes really, uh, begins to take off, the incidence of suicide really begins to take off in the teenage years. So being recognized is really important. Now we get to the individuating stage and 25 roughly to 39 years of age. And this is about releasing the fears of not having enough, first stage of development, not being loved enough, the second stage of development, and not being respect, uh, recognized enough, um, and the third stage of development. And so, you begin to work on yourself. Now, this is the stage where you start to become conscious. Again, most of the people living on the planet never get to this stage. It's about becoming responsible and accountable for your life, and you need freedom and autonomy to do that. So already, if you live in a authoritarian regime, that's going to be difficult. Remember the Arab Spring, this is what it was all about. Here we had young uh, North Africans got an international education, came back to their countries, 
and got high paying jobs, were able to meet their survival, safety and security needs, but then wanting to individuate, but they came up against a regime that wouldn't let them do that, a very authoritarian regime. And that's what that was all about. And so many people from North Africa left uh, North Africa to go to Europe to be in a more democratic regime where they could uh, individuate. Now, we get to the self-actualizing stage, and this is the forties. You know, this is, this was, it's amazing how many people uh, discover their purpose in the world at this age. I, it happened to me, in, I was 45 years old, I was a transportation engineer in the World Bank, and then I suddenly, after being very, very happy with my career, I suddenly got bored, completely bored. And I realized that, you know, I tell this in a bit of a jokey way, that when I was 17, I thought I heard my soul say transportation, but actually my soul said transformation. And uh, so then I really, I reinvented myself to do what I've been doing uh, for the past 30 years. Now I put a picture of a lady here because there is a link between being able to master these stages of development and the impact it, the physical impact it has on our lives, not just the physical, but the mental. And that's the book that uh, Gina was referring to, A New Psychology of Human Wellbeing. I explained that this stage of development is quite difficult for ladies because uh, at this stage, well, let's just see what it's about. Self-expression, becoming fully who you are and looking for meaning and purpose. Now at this stage, ladies uh, often have a husband, uh, a, children and aging parents who are all needing care. Now, so who comes last? So because we're in that situation, this is the fifth stage of development. It's the fifth chakra, is the throat chakra. And, and at this stage of development, it's the upper chest. This, this is when breast cancer takes off. But there are, in my book, I, I make the link between the stages of development and, and, the, and the different diseases. And this, is, for men, it's the next stage, and I'll explain what that means in a moment. So the integrating stage, it's about connecting unconditional loving relationships in order to make a difference. If you can't make a difference, if you can't connect. Now, for men, this is difficult because as boys, we learn don't show your feelings, be strong. And so when we get to the integrating stage, we, we don't have the capacity necessary to actually master this connecting stage. And the issue that uh, finishes up at this point, one second. Uh, the issue at this point is that um, we finish up with prostate cancer um, because there's a link between the six chakra and the second chakra. So then we move to the serving stage, which is all about uh, contributing, selfless service and compassion and a desire to serve the greater good. So when I wrote the book, A New Psychology of Human Wellbeing, I, I put in the, I, I wrote that book when I was 70 and I put in the first introduction, I said, I couldn't have written this book any earlier in my life because I wouldn't have been through all the stages. I wouldn't have understood them. And of course, you know, having been through all of that, uh, now I can look back and say, my God, I remember when I was like that. <laughs> I remember when I was like that. You know, at each stage I had different needs and uh, it, was, uh, it, was, it was interesting to look back. So what about Donald Trump? Okay, everybody knows Donald Trump. So here's an interesting example of somebody who was never individuated because he had so many unmet needs at the first three stages of development, at the survival stage, the conforming stage, and the uh, differentiating stage, he's still trying to get those needs met. You read about his history uh, of his childhood and his teenage years, and clearly he never managed to master any of those stages because he, he didn't, he, he felt insecure, he didn't feel loved enough, and he, he, he couldn't get, recognized. So I, so we, the point is that individuating is fundamentally important to creating a better world. And that's what the Humanity Awareness Initiative is about. I'm building, I'm building 
training uh, programs for young adults to help them through this individuating stage. And yesterday we had a third meeting of the group and we had a group in Indonesia, a group in Sweden, USA, we're starting the group in UK today um, and in Iceland. And we're developing programs to help young people move through this individuating stage. I'm going to say a little bit about what that means in terms of becoming conscious in a moment. But let's just get back to Donald Trump. So here are these different age range, roughly, this is roughly true for everybody. It's difficult to accelerate because the first three stages are all biologically driven. And, you know, young millennials at the individuating stage, 25 to 39, say, well, I must be at the integrating stage because, you know, I want to make a difference. And I say, well, not quite. You want to make a difference because if you want to right a wrong or you want justice or you want to achieve something. Whereas at truly making a difference at the integrating stage is all about empathy and it is driven by empathy. So these are the differences. So in my book, A New Leadership Paradigm, I actually plotted the values of several leaders. And I wrote, as I'm going back to 2010 now, um, I, I, I looked at Donald Trump's book uh, on leadership and I noticed that he had these values. Uh, I put, these are the top values. And if you know that my values work, there are positive values and there are limiting values. And the white dots on this diagram are the limiting values. So at level one, he actually writes about being ruthless. At level two, he writes about in his book about revenge. And at level three, he, he talks about image. Now, so I managed to pick up all of these values and I realized that there's nothing at the transformation level. He, he, he is, he does want to give back up to a point um, and he does have a certain passion that was a level five and level six, but he's totally, totally preoccupied with getting these unmet needs sorted out from his earlier and, and Interestingly, this is a very toxic mix of values. You've got revenge and ruthlessness, which are limiting values, and winning and discipline, which are positive values. And when you put all of these together, you realize you don't want to mess with Donald Trump because he's going to win and he's going to take revenge and be ruthless in order to win and he's going to be disciplined in winning. So this is a, you know, a nasty character. Those are the unmet needs of his childhood. So he never got past. Now, most of the leaders, interestingly, most of the leaders on the planet uh, are like this. They never got past the individuating stage. Now, there are seven nations right now operating at what I call people awareness. So Donald Trump is operating at uh, nation awareness. Uh, Boris Johnson and most of the UK are at wealth awareness. And uh, then Come the Scandinavian nations operating from people awareness. Now there are seven nations in addition to the five Nordics uh, who are operating from people awareness, they include New Zealand, um, uh, Switzerland and five Nordics, seven nations operating from people awareness. These are the highest consciousness nations. What is interesting is that five out of the seven of these nations are run by women. If you go down to the next level, to the wealth awareness, there are nine nations at that level of worldview, and eight of them are run by men. I mean, I found that, I, when I discovered that about a month ago, oh my God, you know, clearly there is a, we're moving into a new worldview that requires women's ability. Now, I've covered this in a different book of mine called The Evolutionary Human. And in that book, I talk about the uh, evolutionary intelligence and the three algorithms of evolutionary intelligence. And these three algorithms uh, explain the whole of evolution from the Big Bang to the present day and explain what is going on right now. And there are three algorithms of this. The first algorithm is when you come up against the situation which is threatening you, you become stronger and you try to beat the situation. So it's basically survival of the fittest. 
Now, this is how men are brought up. This is what they do. Now, the second algorithm is well, when we cannot overcome the threat by getting stronger, then we bond with other like-minded individuals to form a group structure, which enables us to overcome the threat. And then if it's still a big threat, what happens is those groups that bonded together, those individuals are bonded together to form a group. Now groups cooperate with each other to form a higher order entity to overcome the threat. So this is how the United Nations got, for, sorry, the USA formed. There were these, there were these colonies and they had separate money systems. They had separate governments. They had the threat from the King of England. They, they bonded to form this group structure. This group structure became permanent and they cooperated to form this IOD entity called the United States. Same thing happened with the United Nations after World War II. Same thing happened with the European Union. So these are examples of actual the third algorithm of evolutionary intelligence. Now it appears because of their upbringing that women are much stronger at bonding to form a group structure and cooperating to form a higher order group structures. And that's why people awareness, which is the new, which is the worldview of the Nordics, etc., cetera, uh, have women leaders because they know how to do that. And the next worldview that's coming after that, after people awareness is humanity awareness. And I've written a whole piece on that. I've been working on that for three years now. And there's a e-learning course, which you can download free all about humanity awareness. Okay. So I'm going to stop right there for a moment and um, take questions, etc., etc. And we have got much more to go over, but um, we can we'll see how the questions go. I'm going to stop sharing my screen, uh, hopefully. And uh, over to you, Tina. I'm trying to stop sharing my screen. There we go. So, questions, comments, Gina, you're muted. Gina, you're muted. I was very oh, lovely. Geez, I've been talking to you. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, yeah, what I just said was, you said you'd give us meat and potatoes, and that was all meat there. Really oh. <laughs> detailed. Okay, look, I'm no, going to give you some stop. potatoes. No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the potatoes. Okay. okay, so what does conscious mean? You, you call yourself the conscious cafe. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm working on this leadership development e-learning program and I, I realized that actually that leadership is all about becoming conscious. It's about moving through the individual self actualization. So there are two aspects of consciousness of well, becoming conscious. One is that you become aware of how your actions and behaviors impact other people on the planet. Point one, become aware of what you are doing, how it's impacting others on the planet. Point two, you become aware of how your thoughts and beliefs are impacting your mental and physical health. So there's an external dimension of becoming conscious and there's an internal dimension. But that isn't enough to become conscious. You need one more condition. And that condition is to care about the impact that you're having on other people and planet and care about the impact your thoughts and beliefs are actually having on yourself. If you don't care, you're never going to become conscious. So you have to become conscious and care. And then because you care, that is the driver for personal evolution. So that's it. Conscious, becoming conscious in a nutshell, those three conditions. I care right. about my, the impact I have on other people in the planet. I care about how my thoughts um, impact myself and my physical and mental health. And I, I care about this impact. So and I'm going to do something about it because, uh, you know, when I look out in the world, um, you know, the problem I see is myself, basically. And I need to change. <laughs> That's yeah. all about going conscious. That is okay, so with a little bit of potatoes, now we can get yep. to... Okay, so I, I'm going to ask a, a, a question, I'll just flag something up, because, um, you know, you cited Trump as an example, and um, it's really interesting when you say that, and you, 
you know, if you, I like to read behind, you know, when somebody does an individual interview and somebody's looking at them as a whole person, it's really interesting to see behind the scenes. So you, there's a case, isn't there, for us looking at the values of our leaders. And it's interesting, I read the FT the other weekend and they had a long article interview with Sir Keir Starmer, the new leader of the Labour Party. Very, I mean, outwardly, very different individual to the previous Labour leader. But because he was a human rights barrister, already I'm thinking that this man is bringing a new conversation to the table. So I'm looking at that with kind of little informed eyes, but it would be interesting, wouldn't it, in somehow, if we turn the prism of, you know, not just their political background, but really looking at leaders' values, because that gives us the insight into the, their success in how they are as a leader. Comments? Absolutely. What do you think? Yeah, so... Um, how would we do that? Well, uh, well <laughs> it, not many of these, see, most of the leaders who have never individuated are not really that interested in the impact that they have on the world. I mean, you know, look at the Prime Minister of Brazil, he, you know, he really is not, he's not that conscious, you know, he's, he did not embrace the idea that coronavirus is dangerous, uh, Donald Trump has been very slow, um, you know, they're, they're not that conscious, and so they're not really interested in growing and developing, frankly. And so most of the hope, I think, lies in our organizations where we realize, where leaders begin to realize that the, the consciousness of the organization is a reflection of the consciousness of the leader. And, and, and if they want to change the culture, then you either change the leader or the leader has to change. And that is the opening, and that's what I've been working on for a 20 odd years now with the cultural values assessments, helping organizations all over the planet grow and develop. But the only way we can do that is by having the leaders sign up and say, yeah, culture is important. And I realize that culture is a reflection of me and my leadership team. And if we want to change the culture, we have to change. It. So, um, so it demands that people become are conscious and aware that they impact their environment before they're willing to change. This is um, so, you know, so I've got some questions here for you. That's a brilliant. I think actually just describing just that one, two, three gives us this lovely overlay for looking at, you know, being aware of your impact, being aware of yourself and caring is it in a nutshell. That's a great prison. So um, uh, I've got some questions here. <clears throat> Can you get stuck at one of the levels, for example, if you had a traumatic child? Yeah. And I was looking at this. What could, if you, if you are stuck there, can you, can you move out yeah. of that? Yeah, so, um, yes, okay, so just a little, uh, Judy knows about this because she almost came to our course in Italy. We run it every year, it's a four day course. Um, it's uh, Living Your Soul Destiny, but this is, the whole purpose of the course is that it's about recognizing that where you are in the stage of development and what's holding you back. And what's holding you back are the limiting beliefs from the first three stages of development. Either I don't have enough, I'm not loved enough, or I'm not enough. Now, under those three, we can find 18 um, what we call maladaptive shamer. These are things that go wrong in your childhood that lead you to a limiting belief about, uh, similar to the limiting beliefs that I believe Donald Trump and many other Putin have, oh, they have these limiting beliefs, and they hold them back from developing. Now, the idea is, that first of all, you've got to identify what that limiting belief is, name it, and then you can manage it, and then you can get past it. So, so that's what we do every year in our four-day course in Italy. Now, I decided to make that into an e-learning course, and so uh, uh, one of the e-learning programs is called Five Steps to Soul Activation, and 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 basically replicate that course in an e-learning program as best that I can. Um, and uh, so, yeah, first thing, what, um, when you get upset, you know, what is it, what are the thoughts, what are the feelings, what are the needs that you have that are not being met? And, and then what is the belief driving that? And that links into the work of Byron Katie, where she does that work. And then you examine the belief and say, well, actually, it's not really true. It was true in my childhood, but it's no longer true. I can give that up. Kind of. yeah. um, right. Okay. So, um, so that leads to an eight-step eight process, which uh, 
it's built around that process and, uh, and that's in the e-learning program and the course that we do. So yeah, you, everybody gets stuck a bit. Everybody gets stuck at, uh, at some point and uh, you just have to dig deeper and find out what the fear. Now, the, the issue really is that you are a soul having a human experience. Therefore, you are an energetic being and the energy of love is the energy of the soul. Now, the energy of the fear-driven ego is fear and it's a low vibrational frequency. So the low vibrational frequency of fear cannot mix with the high vibrational frequency of love. And so it stops you from moving in, activating your soul because as you then as you let go of these fear-based energies, you open up to the possibility of the influence of the love-based energies of the soul. And that's what individuation and self-actualization is all about. It's like letting go of the energy of fear, subconscious fear, unconscious fear. I mean, we even let fear in the root womb. You know, if our, if our mother, if the mother was taking drugs or alcohol, you know, the, that impacted at a deep level uh, the, 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 the body mind of the baby. And uh, so, you know, there are remedies for that too. Um, you have to go back to that stage of development and relive those experiences in order to identify them and let them go. But most of us, um, you know, we can just do that mentally. Uh, the more severe cases, we need psychotherapeutic help. Um, and even in the most severe cases, we need to, you know, go back to that rebirthing whole idea. So they, I think that's the answer to the question. Yes, you can move forward. Brilliant. Quite a few questions here. And there's one that's slightly related that if I kind of look into it, it said, mentioned events for people, you've mentioned events for people at individuation stage. Is it possible to get to the stage at the age you mention, Or could we encourage younger people to look at this stage earlier so it's integrated more? Bring on yes. the stage earlier. Yes, 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 yes. And this is the problem of our education system. Yeah, yeah. See, because you see, we are, so there are many things to say about this, but the worldview you operate from influences every aspect of living in the, so living in the worldview of wealth awareness, which we do mostly in the UK, the education system is built in order to, along the ideas of, the, of wealth awareness. So it's like reading, writing, arithmetic, go to, get a business degree, etc. economics. You move into the next stage, people awareness, and the education system looks different. It's, you know, it's more about emotional intelligence. It's about getting along with your neighbor, etc., etc. So how can we influence young people? We, we can't influence them getting through to the individuating stage any faster, but once they get there, we can make it easier for them to move through it. And how do we do that? by emphasizing in our education system that the three aspects of soul's desires, self-expression, connection, and contribution. So if you teach your kids how to self-express, how to connect, and how to contribute, when they get to the individuating stage, they have this head start of going through the individuating and then all the other stages. And there are a lot of kids around who are like that. And that's brilliant because it means that the evolution of human consciousness is accelerating quite rapidly. And we can, my whole idea with the humanity awareness movement is to make it accelerate even more rapidly. Mm. There are some kids who are way beyond their years compared to what we might know in our generations. Um, I think I'll just have to go through the order of what they're looking at here. Um, <clears throat> who's currently a good example of a leader who has individuated? Well, we just go to the, you know, the five, Nordic nations and in New Zealand, oh my gosh, this lady, what's her name, Jacanda or what's her name? Um, Ahern, Jacinda Ahern. Jacinda. Wow, not only is she individuated, she's self-actualized, absolutely. And you can see that in just how the way she handles that. She's what I call, approaching what I call a full spectrum leader. That is, she can operate all seven levels of consciousness with confidence. You know, she doesn't let anything get to her. So she's tamed her fears and she can just handle it. I mean, she was on a TV morning show a few days ago and there was an earthquake. 
I don't know whether you saw that. Well, I, I saw and, about I mean, it. I didn't see the <laughs> <exactly. laughs> Oh, things are shaking around here. Oh, and then so the guy says, well, you know, do you want to stop the interview? She said, no, no, that's fine. <laughs> Yeah. But this is, no, uh, you know, and then if you want another example, go to Iceland. Yes. That's an amazing 39 year old. Yeah. Uh, go to Finland, even younger. I mean, women running nations, uh, let's have more of it. For God's sake, I'm so fed up with this male patriarchy and stuff. Richard, but one, one thing about the female leaders though, when you have a country that as a culture isn't ready for a female leader, it makes it more difficult for her to operate. So I think what you're pointing out about the Nordic countries is they're ready and elected the leader. But look at Australia and uh, Julia Gillard and the trouble yeah. she had. She was... Yeah, exactly. You're exactly right. Because you see, the worldview in the country represents the average level of consciousness of the nation. And so in Australia, they're just at the end of the third stage of development, self-esteem, consciousness, differentiating stage. And it's, you know, it's all, it's all boys network. It's like balls and this and that. And, and, and women can't survive in that. You know, or the only way they can survive, and, and Theresa May showed this in a way, is to become like one of them. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the worst Authoritarian, thing. Authoritarian, right. you know? Um, okay, so we answer the lead. Dealing with uh, the fear of change, when transformation itself is traumatizing, how do you get through that? Oh, okay, so this is where, um, how do you get <laughs> Okay, so, I'm, 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 a little more involved story. Okay. So, uh, I guess everybody on this call has been angry at some point. And maybe you still get angry. Okay. Well, oh, the reason you get angry is because your needs are not being met. That's the only reason we get angry, because our needs are not being met. Um, and so we have to find a way to replace anger. And uh, the, uh, we have to somehow get past the anger. And the, we, the way we replace anger is through really understanding. Understanding self and understanding the other. So here I am standing in the line, a long line, a long queue in front of uh, something where I'm trying to get something and I am getting very pissed off and I'm getting very frustrated and impatient. Okay, I, I'm doing that to myself. This person in the front there is not doing it to me. I am doing that myself. We make ourselves angry and upset because we think we have needs. And then we blame it on the other person. So, if you can move from anger to understanding, you can understand, okay, yeah, this person's got some problems, they're not able to deal with it. And I have a problem because I'm not, I have a need that I think is really important. And if I could let go of that need, I wouldn't get angry. So every time we get upset, we do it to ourselves, basically. So, um, sorry, I forgot the question. What was the question? The qu <laughs> I'm gonna have to go back and look. <laughs> Okay. Well, oh, it's, it's about the dealing with the fear of change when transformation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. I'll get there in a minute. Okay. So, so fear of change is the fact that you don't trust. You, you know, um, you learn at some point in your life not to trust, and so what I've come to the conclusion is I am a soul having a human experience. I don't have a soul. I've surrendered to my soul. And when you surrender to the soul, you have to trust the soul. Now the soul operates at a different level of uh, consciousness. So when you have synchronicity in your life, for example, that's your soul taking care of things. And if, if you can get to the point where you can trust your soul, you can become fully immersed in soul consciousness and life gets easy. Because whatever problem that comes up, you go, oh, here's another opportunity. Mm -hmm. Here's another opportunity. And, and the only get you reason you get upset because you think you have a need. So, <laughs> I mean, it sounds strange, but I have no needs. Yeah. The ego part of me has no longer any needs because every need I could possibly have is already sorted out for me before I even know 
that I have that need by my soul arranging my life so that it's perfect. The problem is I have to recognize that it's perfect. And so, so something happens that I don't quite like. I have to somehow realize that that is perfect. And when I look back a year or two from now, I go, boy, that was perfect. Yeah, so trusting the soul is a huge step. The five steps to soul activation is the last step. Trusting the soul, well, becoming one with the soul is the last step, but the fourth step is trusting the soul. It's, it's, it's moving away from, and that I, I remember the saying I used to have, when one door closes, another one slams in your face, is a negative <laughs> way. Or you could say, when one door opens, when one door closes, another one opens, or a window opens. <laughs> That's the trusting. That yeah, but I, actually, you have to make that happen in your mind. You have to have you can't make that happen in your mind, and you've got to trust who you really are. You, you know, you don't have a soul. For heaven's sake, get over the fact you don't have a soul. You are the soul. It changes everything in your life when you live there and you let and you surrender to the soul. Your whole life. Now, is it easy? No. It takes, it takes a lot of time to move into that space, but it's well worth the journey. Now, mentioning journey, you know, I talk about spirituality. Or people talk about spirituality. And I say, well, look, if you're focused on spirituality, you're focused on the journey. And you're going to learn lots of good stuff. But what you really need to focus on is the destination. And the destination is soul consciousness. So if you spend your whole life focusing on spirituality, you're never going to get to the destination, which is soul consciousness. So go straight for soul consciousness. Any techniques you've learned for spiritual techniques like yoga, meditation, are all helpful. But without the destination in mind, you're just going to keep on doing that the rest of your life and you'll never get there. Wonderful, exactly. Um, culture, as a, culture as a whole, is often a very powerful force of influence over individual development. What role does culture collectively play in your analysis of soul development? If I have read that right from Dave, that makes sense. Can I, it can be an in inhibitor or it can be a, a promoter. <clears throat> so, um, this is why I like to I link the stages of development to worldviews. So, the Nordic nations are at the fourth stage of personal development with the majority of people. And so they, they're, they're at the individuating stage. And what I'm trying to do now is build a worldview, which is the next stage, which is the uh, self-actualization stage. Now, um, if you live in a culture that doesn't allow you the freedom to be who you are, you're never going to evolve. Now, most of the nations, the majority of the nations on the planet operate from what I call state awareness, which is like three levels down from the Nordics. You know, people awareness, the Nordics, nine nations in Europe operating and Australia operating from wealth awareness, 20 odd nations operating from nation awareness and the rest operating from state awareness. Now, let's say you're gay, you're lesbian or if you live in anything other than uh, a de democracy at the, with the level of wealth awareness or people awareness, which is the majority of the nation, you're not going to have the freedom to be who you are and express who you are. And transgender people, same problem. So it inhibits self-expression. So culture and worldviews inhibit self-expression. And uh, so it, it's, uh, so accelerating the evolution of worldviews is important. Now, what is a worldview? There are three aspects to a worldview. I explained that in my book, um, Worldview by Dynamics, and the worldview of the nation. And um, in that um, book, I said plain that worldview is made up of um, cultural belief system, uh, sorry, cosmology, because your cultural belief system and personal belief system. Now your cosmology is what you regard as the divine creator provider and your relationship to that, whatever that is. Your uh, cultural belief system is how you interact 
with other people to get your needs met inside the framework of your existence. The personal belief system is what we've been talking about. It's about the things that upset you, it's your egos, fears, etc. Now, the, the personal belief system operates on a minute by minute situation. The cultural belief system operates through your life. You live inside this culture and you have to somehow find your way in it. And your cosmology is uh, beyond this life. It's like, oh, oh yeah, you know, I can see that there is another life out there. Now, <coughs> excuse me. In nation awareness, which was the one before uh, wealth awareness, which is the Catholic nations of Europe, for example, nation awareness, um, and the North Africa, um, our cosmology was a monotheistic religion, one God. <clears throat> when we moved into wealth awareness, we replaced that external God with science, and, and, like, and we, we, we focused on uh, random mutations. Science had the answer to everything. And so there was no God in science, in, in the wealth awareness. And that's why many people, young people, lose their way in that because there's actually no God. Now, in people awareness, which is Nordics, New Zealand, the new, that cosmology is spirituality. Um, and now, the, the God outside, which then was replaced with no God, has now become the God inside. Very interesting shift. That's people awareness. As we move to humanity awareness, we move out of spirituality into soul awareness, which is what I was talking about. And that's why I'm focused on how can we accelerate humanity awareness because it comes with a new cosmology. It comes with a full self-expression. It has so many benefits. And uh, on the website and in the free e-learning courses, I've described all of those in great detail. Okay. Wonderful. Um, well done, Richard. This is great. Somebody's dropped off. I'm really missing them. Um, uh, looking for the comment now. It's moved, but it was about because um, I made a note of it as well. You talked about <clears throat> living in the same town, you know, staying there, um, three generations of family, knowing everybody. Uh, versus going traveling, going away, going to university away, uh, maybe coming back or not. Um, yeah. Do you need to do that travel? Do you need to do that higher education to be along with your peers, moving up the levels that you're talking about? Or can you stay at home in the same neighborhood, in the same environment, and have that kind of advancement? Or do you have to do that kind of hero's journey and go away and, and come back? So I think you did, Gina, and I did. We did the hero's journey. I know young people, I have young people who work with me, mm -hmm. 21, 22, who don't have to do that because they're born to self-actualized parents. Mm -hmm. Right? They're born to self-actualized parents. They, they have this amazing relationship with parents and the parents understand. They don't understand, but intuitively they know to encourage their children to self-express, connect, and contribute. I'm, I, I have a 22-year-old, I can't call her an employee because I don't employ her all the time, but she works with me, does all my spreadsheets and everything, all my work on, on the consciousness of nations. She's 22 years old, and she brought up by self-actualized parent, and she totally gets it all. I mean, she, I, 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 everything I do, I send to her, I say, I say, Zoe, take a look at that. What do you think about that? And she comes back with these amazing thoughts, I think. Wow. Yeah, I mean, she is at university, but she's not away from home very much. So you don't have to. The key is parental. Where are your parents? Now, you know, I was brought up in Hull in Yorkshire. Um, lovely, loving parents, but not self-actualized. I had to go off to Manchester University. I went up to Newcastle University. I went down to London. I traveled, uh, lived in America for 25 years. I, you know, I had to, I had to, and then, so the, the unfortunate thing was when I came back to visit my mom in Hull, because my dad died when I was 17, it was hard to relate because she was still in that worldview where she'd never really individuated because she'd never had an opportunity. My dad hadn't, dad didn't have an opportunity. So sometimes it made conversations difficult, you know, and 
and, and, and then you have to realize that that's because they operating from a different worldview and it's not right or wrong it's just how it is and so if you've got self-actualized parents that's a huge boon if not then you really need to get out of your uh, community now this is what happened in the Scandinavian nations that's why they're so advanced it happened in 1850 when people um, in, De in Norway, Sweden and Denmark realized that the leaders realized that the industrial revolution was coming along and all of these people, you know, country bumpkins who lived in these little towns, were gonna have to face huge changes. And many of them would have to move to the big towns. So they started a program called Bildung. Now that's exactly what I'm trying to do in humanity awareness. But this was basically a process of individuation uh, of differentiating, individuating, teaching to people to become conscious so that they could actually move from their local environment into a much bigger environment and feel that they can author their lives and that they were not controlled by the community. And that's the key. It comes back to being conscious, feeling in control of your life, being responsible and accountable. So, yeah, it depends. Um, the answer. Um, I'm going to, I've seen something here, but I'm going to pick up on older people because you made that comment about um, you are where you are with your age and it's giving you that view back over time. And, uh, you know, I really do feel that things I, if I had written that book five years ago, it would be a different book. I'd want to delete it in a sense because, you know, I am growing and gathering all the time. Well, that's an excuse not to write a book. But how do we then harness, how do we then really look at older people um, and shift the, you know, the societal view to invite their leaders. And I'll just say one thing about what we have now with this uh, pandemic is that we keep talking about older people and immediately we see a Zimmer frame, we see slippers shuffling across the floor and that okay. media view of Tina, stop. Look at me. How old am I? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm 75 for God's sake. Not a Zimmer frame in sight. I, I know. Why do they do it? Why do they say old people have to be sidelined when a lot of them are extremely healthy? Well, because a lot of old people never managed to individuate because they never had the opportunity to individuate. My mum never had. My dad didn't. They never had that opportunity. And, and so they, they lived, in a way, they lived small lives. But it was, was what it was. And they, my mum was highly regarded in her local community. She was the cleaner at the local chapel. She arranged the flowers at the local chapel. She did weddings and funerals. And in her little environment, she was Mrs. Barrett. And you didn't mess with Mrs. Barrett. But, but she lived to be 100. But she, she never individuated in South Africa. She, she, she did what she was, she self-expressed. She connected and she contributed, but without having to move through all of those high stages of development. Because, you know, she just never had the opportunity to do that. So, so, so we, we owe a duty to uh, older people to recognize where they are in their stages of development and accept that's where they are. This is where I am. This is where you are. And, and, and we, need to, we need to bring them in. So, you know, I want to replace party politics and humanity awareness with politics whereby there are people from a different age group, different stages of development, who are represented at a local level and at a national level. Right now, we have party politics. It doesn't work. But because at each stage of development we have different needs, we need a government that says, okay, so what do the 20 year olds think about this? What do the 30 year olds, what are the 40 year olds, what are the 50, what are the 60 year olds think about? This? We need, because we all got different needs at different stages of development. And so it's, it's you know, I won't say democracy has been hijacked, it's not been hijacked, it's just not developed to the point <clears throat> where it is appropriate for meeting all our needs. Somebody just mentioned about Sir Tom Moore. Yeah, he was, <clears throat> and used the word elder as well. I think elder. You know, we have, but we do have to look <clears throat> very differently because 
yeah, the other the other aspect, because where a lot of us are going to now live to a hundred, is we see pictures of older people, and what they're doing when they talk to this generation is they have they're drinking champagne in a sunset on a cruise. And really, I have to say that life has gone because now we, you know, we're coming out of this pandemic. The world is changing. We have, to, you know, there is no retirement where you, I mean, who wants to go around a cruise ship anyway? We do have to look at me. I love going on a cruise. <laughs> I do as well. But <laughs> I love a cruise. Love it. <laughs> but only for two or three weeks a year. <laughs> but they're not safe at the moment. Though. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. One of my best friends, she's 27. <clears throat> I've been mentoring her for a number of years. She's an amazing singer. She sings on a cruise ship. She absolutely loves it. She really loves it. She's a very spiritual person. And she, and she started doing meditations on the cruise ship for, for the passengers. You know what I mean? So you can go on a cruise ship and still be who you are and live from that, even when you're 27 years old. I have to step into our eldership. Question here about how does your work align with Ken Wilbur, uh, Robert Keegan, adult development? Sure. No, Robert Keegan, okay. Ken Wilbur. Okay, so I, I've integrated Keegan. Uh, <clears throat> the first three stages represent a socialized mind. Um, the next stage, the fourth stage, represents the self authoring mind, and the upper three stages represent the self transforming mind. I've written about that, it's in my, it's in my uh, e learning courses. With Ken Wilbur, I find Ken Wilber uh, overly intellectual. He talks in a language that most of the world can't understand. Um, and because he's an academic and he's looking for recognition from other academics. And I think that's a mistake, frankly. I want to talk in a language where, which is a common language and I'm constantly focusing on how can I change my language so that people get what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a lot of the same things as Ken Wilber, and I've, you know, I've got a whole library of Ken Wilber here, but I've left it behind a bit because it's, it's hugely academic and it's hugely focused on other academicians. So now I'm not a big believer in the academics for one particular reason. <clears throat> and I put this at the front of the book on youth psychology and human well-being. Um, 50, 60 years ago, we had, Carl Jung was coming to the end of his years. We had Roberto Asagioli, he, he died. We had Abraham Maslow. They all understood the role of the soul. I mean, Carl Jung really got it, Asagioli really got it. And so psychology included the soul. When science and academia, academia came in 50 years ago, the soul went out of psychology completely. It became totally behavioral. And that's why I said in front of the book, I want to bring the soul back to psychology because it is such a fundamental. And this is where, you know, I feel that, that you know, Ken Wilber fails us in that respect. He doesn't give enough emphasis to the true nature of who we are. I mean, yeah, he covers it all. It's great stuff, but it's all intellectual. He never gets... For me, it doesn't get to the depth of understanding that uh, where we can all incorporate it into our lives. Well, intellectually, it's great, but incorporating into our lives, yeah. So the problem is that you know, I, I made this comment. I, I reviewed a book just two weeks ago from a. So, um, academician who was writing a book about psychology and they talked about ego development and eco development and I said you know this comes straight from academia I said you know you're talking about apples and oranges I mean the ego was created by the soul to, in order to act as a buffer so that it would not feel the pain of separation of being in this three-dimensional material world the eco self, it's, it's, it's got nothing to do with, that's just a, a way of looking at the world. It's nothing to do with deep psychology. And so, so, so the universities in the psychological field are searching to try and find ways of explaining soul in words that don't use the word soul. Yeah, I, I, I think we I think, 
we've shifted, Richard. I think the language for everything is shifting. You know, um, when Phil uh, from the Barrett Academy uh, Value Center was uh, doing a webinar the other day, which I joined, your team had done a, a, a review, a values assessment pre-COVID times, and then done one afterwards. And they did this brilliant webinar, which we can put on a link for everybody to see. Um, looking at how values have shifted and they were saying in seven years you'd expect five to six seven years you'd expect a cultural shift and that happened in six or seven weeks and the, the shift uh, you're talking about the wealth uh, awareness of the nation shifted as we can see on a thursday night at eight o'clock with the applause well-being caring really the values have shifted so there isn't a going well, i don't think there's a going back we'll have to see but there's so many new words and the vocabulary shifted hasn't it and i think somebody made the comment here about has the pandemic been like a hero's journey in itself where are we yeah. all in the last few weeks and what are we emerging to <clears throat> i think um there is that possibility now i think it it depends on where the nation or the leader is already. So some nations with certain leaders who are fear-driven and authoritarian will use this pandemic to bring in more control. That's no question. Others who are more evolved will get the fact that we have to become more connected and will move upwards in consciousness. So there could be an interesting divide happening now, I already see this happening in the European Union. I mapped the values of the European nations of the Union. There's a report on my website about that. And I noticed this was already happening, that the, the, the most recent countries coming into the European Union are the ones that are operating from, there are, there are four world views in the countries in the European Union. Well, top end of the scale, you've got people awareness with the Nordics and Ireland. Then you've got the wealth awareness with the Protestant nations in the uh, northern part of Europe. Then you've got nation awareness in the Catholic nations. And then on the, on, on, in the east, you've got the old communist countries which operate in state awareness. So it's no, there's no, you don't have to wonder why the European Union is almost impossible to manage because you've got four different worldviews. But what I noticed as I've been collecting this data year by year is that there is a divergence between the certain of the uh, more recent people um, nations coming in and the ones that the more advanced nations and those are evolving in consciousness and the other ones are yeah hanging about at the same level or going down like hungary for example has become more authoritarian um maybe because of its leader and so um we have an opportunity in front of us uh, post covid to build a hugely better world um, and there is also the possibility of going in the other direction. And what's going to happen? I don't know. Um, I think, you see, I, I see consciousness has been evolving for 200,000 years in Homo sapiens. So I see that that's what, it's going to happen anyhow. It's, it's just whether this COVID thing will accelerate that or hold it back. I don't know but I'm hoping it's going to accelerate and I'm planning for it to accelerate. Yeah, I haven't had that thought of it holding it back, but what, you, what, how you're presenting, I was going to ask you how you calculated <clears throat> nation awareness, because I can see you've got advancing countries and then you've got those held back, you've got an even greater divide and you were just saying that. How do you calculate this nation awareness? Okay. Well, look, can I just share my screen again? I can show you on the website, it's very easy. Yeah. Um, okay. All right, so we're going to go to, um, um, where are we going? Excuse me while I just figure out where I am. I won't look at your screen. Mind you, else. Okay, very good. Can you see my screen? I can. Yeah, we all can. Okay. So let's go to societal evolution. We'll go to the aspects of consciousness. A great resource. This is Richard. Fantastic. Uh, so here, uh, it's got the latest data from 2019. We've got a map of the world, okay? Mm -hmm. And these colors represent different worldviews. So green is people, orange is wealth, etc. Different levels of state awareness. So if you click on a country, it comes up with a GCI score 
that's UK, ranked number 15 in terms of consciousness, and last year it went down 3.8%. If I turn the globe, we we'll go to the USA, it ranks number 22. Well, that isn't, that's a mistake there. It's not 449% decrease. I was going to say that's, yeah, that's it's four point four nine. And then um, change in Canada, again, gone down 12. Now, if we go to uh, wow. Finland, number four, Norway, number three, and Norway was number one the year before last. Switzerland ranks number one right now with a score of 658. Now, how do we calculate that? So I uh, have this uh, global consciousness indicator. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I did was, I, I got the seven levels of consciousness. OK, that's the model. And then I found global indicators representing the survival level, the relationship level, etc. And so at the survival level, we've got the seven levels here. You've got satisfying citizens' needs for health care and economic performance. And so I picked out three indicators that measure that. One is the level of corruption, uh, health, and economic performance. So for every level of consciousness, I found indicators. I found four for level four, which is about uh, gender equality, press freedom, et cetera, et cetera. And then, so, so then what I did was I aggregated all of the scores for these 17 indicators by level. And I had to normalize the scores because each, each indicator had its own scale. I normalized the scores, added them up, and then got a score for each level of consciousness for every nation. And so um, that allowed me, these are 2019 scores, um, uh, to rank all nations by level of consciousness, here are the scores, and by total score, and the top seven, I, all, I said, are operating from people awareness, and then we see and, and, and you can see, um, you know, so if I go back to, so we see Switzerland, Denmark, and Norway, the top three. If I go back to 2018, Norway, New Zealand, and Finland, you know, the, the scores didn't change that much, but there was a, there was a movement. Um, and so um, the, uh, here, you click on here, you'll find a report that says, basically, now this is one of the free courses on the uh, e-learning um, mm -hmm. called, uh, why isn't that working? There we go. So here, this is what's been happening in the world. So, you know, the average level of consciousness in, the, in 145 nations went up, up and up to 2018, and then dropped significantly in 2019. Um, and in this e-learning course, which is free, you can see, get a full report. Here's a report on the European Union, here's a report on the Nordic nations, and here are the, um, you know, if you, if you click on this, you see this is information about the uh, world, uh, world views and global consciousness indicators for, for last year. They can see the, the, the kind of more information about the culture that they grew up in or that they live in now by having a look at that. That's brilliant. Thank you. So, uh, and so, you know, if you want to get these free courses, you simply go here, sign up here for the e-learning courses, and those three courses will then appear automatically in your dashboard up here on the top right-hand corner. And you can click on your dashboard and you will find your courses. I've got, of course, I've got all of them in mine. And then you can just go, oh, okay, that's a free one. That's the one I've just got. And then you can see the course and then you can start the course. Yeah. Richard, and, somebody just asked, what, is, um, how, what does wealth have to do with the nation's standing? Well, it, okay, so the, the, these are different worldviews. Yeah. Wealth doesn't have anything to do. It, it, well, it, it does. I mean, it's not wealth, it's, there are 17 indicators, okay? So I, um, wealth, wealth plays into it. Economic performance plays into it. Wealth doesn't play into it. Um, but there are 17 indicators to, to establish 
the consciousness of the nation and, and economic performance is just one of those uh, amongst them happiness index gender equality environmental issues uh, 17 different issues now all of the people who are producing these indicators are you know i've been doing it for years and so i all i do is i take their data i normalize it add it up and come to a global consciousness indicator that's all i've done i mean all i mean it's, it's a big chunk of work i think you can imagine getting all of these 17 indicators for 145 countries and then doing all the statistical analysis and that's why my friend zoe who's 22 does all that for me because she's got the agility of the mind and at the same time the technological skills to do that wow richard this has been fabulous we're really coming to uh, virtually the close now actually this is one of the flag up i wanted to flag up as interesting and that is you mentioned the gender difference in those levels when you talked about level five and the self-actualizing and, and the, the, more challenge, the challenges that more women have in that age group of 40 to 49. Um, and interestingly, for years I've been hosted women's gatherings around the world and comparing, great for me to see year by year, um, you know, that's why I kind of wrote about the rise of the feminine, I could see that in Sydney, in, in California and the UK. And the conversations were so in the 40s to 50s of women who'd left an organization because of big values misalignment. They just couldn't stay there anymore and really working on their self-expression. And uh, I have not hosted groups of men, but I, I can see what you're saying about how, you know, boys brought up what to believe in and how that can form, um, you know, a barrier to them in their integration in their later years. So it's really interesting distinction on gender. Also shows up in the uh, suicide statistics, uh, you know, um, boy, you know, teenage boys uh, regard to teenage women, uh, it's hugely different rate of suicide um, because, you know, women are more able to share what they're feeling with other girls. Boys are not. Not so far. This is hopefully something we can help shift. And I, I think that, uh, you know, like Mental Health Awareness Week that we've just had, you know, the young royals being involved, there are so many men now talking about their feelings and there's a big, I've noticed a real big shift in how masculinity is changing, but it takes a long time to shift, doesn't it? You know, there's, there's, the signs of- Generations. The signs of land, but things a long time to shift. Um, Richard, a massive thank you. Uh, people are so enjoying it. You can, folks, you can put comments on here. We couldn't, I think we got through most of the questions. It was, you've given so much for people. I'm so glad we report, recorded it because I know for sure myself, I'm going to watch it again. And um, I don't know whether you're willing to share your slides. If you are, you can send them to me. If not, that's oh. fine. But um, <clears throat> you can send them as a PDF and I'll write to everybody with that. Um, can we all wave? And thank Richard. <laughs> it was really fantastic. So just before I go, folks, just to say that we're meeting again, we have another, somebody's called it a wonderful Wednesday webinar. How nice. We're meeting again in three weeks time. We're talking to Dr. David Paul from Sydney. Um, he's a global expert on complex change. He, and David will be so interested in your work, uh, Richard. Well, he knows you, you know him maybe David, Dr. David Paul. He's been to your event in Sydney some time ago. And he's gonna be talking about um, igniting an inner change revolution and how we can't make that change within unless we're more conscious and we're more collaborative. It's gonna align so well with everything you talked about today. So that's, we'll send that notice out to people. That's uh, June 17. Richard, massive thank you. Wonderful. Thanks to everybody for showing up today. We've all been here for the whole duration and it's been amazing. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. It's been a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> it has. It's and it's been so nice to reconnect with you, Gina. We haven't seen each other for 15 or 20 years, so that's been another bonus. Yeah, it's been lovely. I've so enjoyed it. Follow your work. Great. And I'm going to send out the link for the, uh, the Value Centre webinar that was done. It was fascinating. I think people would be really interested. I mean, we're interested in your work anyway, but I think there's a high level of interest in um, the, the vocabulary and the structure you put to thinking that helps us now. And this is what we're talking about now. How do we navigate ourselves out of the situation we're personally in? How do we navigate out of our 
wider situation in, and as the world emerges into the new. So, yes, having the vocabulary, the words, the, the structure for things that, in, you know, inside our being is often difficult to talk about, isn't it? Yeah. Put words to it. Yep. Yeah. We, need, we need a new vocabulary. We do. And not an academic vocabulary. I, academic. You know. We need it spoken like a true Yorkshireman. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep it simple, love, will you? Just go and get some fish and chips and we'll be all right. Cup of tea. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> oh, this is fun. We could talk all day, actually. <laughs> yeah, because we could, yeah. <laughs> go. Okay, bye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> I should really unmute all but all had a newborn baby and then I was mixing with other adults. Yeah. Bye everyone. Lovely. Lovely. Oh, so many familiar faces. Lovely. Great. I unmuted people, but people having side conversations. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm going to do that. That's wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Geraldine. Lovely to see you. Hi there, Adrina. How are Lovely. you doing? I'm doing great. I think we last met in Rome, didn't we? Yeah, I was trying to think where it was. It was at Wynn, wasn't it? It was at Wynn at Rome, yeah. Just put my, uh, let me just put my video on. I've been listening to it without the video. There I am. Oh, Hi. Awesome. Yeah. Very good to see you again. I get your newsletter and I uh, see how you're doing. I follow your progress with great interest. So it's great to see you again. Are you based in Ireland at the moment? I live in Ireland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've lived here for 18 years. Yeah, yeah. Do you know, do you know Judy? Judy? Yeah, because... No. Okay, because I'm sure, Geraldine, I think one of the first times we met was at the Brahma Kumaris, was it? Oh, that's right. No, well, Judy, Judy also hosts the BK events, and she may well have been there at that event. Judy was the one who founded Conscious Cafe. Oh, that's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a long, a long while ago. Yeah, long lovely to know people are coming from Ireland. That's brilliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. It's a very spiritual country, actually, in uh, in lots of ways. I was when I came here, I was amazed. People just. Not what I would call naturally spiritual. They don't think it's something they have to acquire. You can see it in them and in how they are. Wonderful. Mm. Do, you, do you think that's because they're still closer to uh, folklore and magic? They yeah, accept. I think there's a lot of that. Yes, there. There's a normal way of being, so they're kind of more expansive. In yeah. The yeah, I think there's a lot of that. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Well, anyway, so it's good. Good to see you, Gina. Good to meet see you. See you. Thanks for joining bye. us. Yeah, okay. Maybe see you well in the next one. <laughs> okay. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, bye. bye, bye. bye, bye. bye Sharon. Bye, bye Sharon. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, Judy, we, we could go and we could meet on... on yeah. The... <laughs> For, okay, so you, I'll speak to you on what... Yeah, I'll talk to you on WhatsApp. Oh, okay. I think... Uh, stop recording. Oh, dear. Pause, stop recording, stop <laughs> recording, cancel, stop recording.